heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. Caroline Hyde's off today. This is Bloomberg Technology coming up on the program. Full earnings coverage ahead from Qualcomm to Etsy, Expedia and beyond. We got you covered. Plus, we sit down for an exclusive conversation with Flexport founder Ryan Peterson, who's joined Founders Fund as a partner. His thoughts on where he's going to invest in the world of venture capital. And superconductivity, it's having a moment everyone is obsessed. We'll explain why a potential breakthrough in the technology has been driving both excitement and controversy. Uh, let's get a quick look at the markets first. We are treading water, frankly, on the technology corners of the equity market. Look at the Nasdaq 100, basically flat. Earnings are a big part of the story, but we see a sell-off in treasuries. The yield on the US 10-year treasury at its highest level in nine months. There is concerns about the cost of borrowing. More dynamic movement in the chip space. The Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, or SOX, underperforming, softer by three-tenths of one percent. A big part of that is Qualcomm, down 10 percent. We will get to those details with Bloomberg's Ian King shortly. The two big ones that we're braced for, Apple and Amazon report after the bell. We're going to look ahead and think about what the macro environment means for those two names, both from the consumer perspective, but when it comes to Amazon, also the cloud narrative with AWS. Remember last week, Microsoft showed slowing growth in cloud. That is their biggest direct competitor. Does it translate to AWS? Two earnings already out and weighing on markets this morning. Etsy and Qualcomm. Starting with Etsy, yeah, look, we're down 12%. Concern about the growth outlook for them. We're going to go talk to Shweta Kajuria about that in just a moment. And then Qualcomm, down 10%. Tracking on a closing basis for its biggest drop since March of 2020. The story here is that this is the biggest maker of smartphone processors in a market for smartphones that is having one of the most severe slowdowns for a long time, and it continues. The outlook that they gave was worrying for the current period. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Ian King. He covers everything semiconductors for us. What were the sort of main takeaways from that earnings print, Ian? Yeah, I mean, the big focus here was where are we with the smartphone inventory correction? Um, and the answer was we're still in that inventory correction. China, you know, everybody was hoping the Chinese consumer would come back, and that just doesn't appear to be the case. It's their main market, right? And you, you forget that in China there are many domestic players who make Android platform phones. The other data point that we get from Qualcomm is this full-year shipments forecast. What did they say about 2023 relative to 2022? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a down year. You know, we're looking high single percentages down from a year ago, and that clearly indicates that not only have we still got inventory, but also consumers just aren't coming rushing back. When I think of Qualcomm, I said it just then, the biggest maker of smartphone processors, the other side of their business is modems. And we are always asking questions about the future relationship between Qualcomm yeah. and Apple and the iPhone. What did Cristiano Amon, the CEO, say about that? Yeah, I mean, this, is, this always comes up on their call. This is always a point of contention because, obviously, they had a massive legal fight and Apple was forced to go back to them and ask for their technology. So that's the background. What he did was confirm that when we have the new iPhone later this year, Qualcomm will be in there. Their modem will be what takes that iPhone through until next year. I just want to know, so, hey, is this the end of the show? Uh, do, do Apple do their own thing, as Bloomberg has reported? And he just refused to talk about that, so that leaves open the potential that maybe we'll see Qualcomm in there in the future. We were just showing, actually, some of what Cristiano Amon was saying. I want to bring those comments back because... The other standalone story was them reacting to this environment with cost-cutting measures, yeah. and that includes job cuts. What did, what did they say? Yeah, no, I mean, well, they didn't actually say it explicitly on the call, but if you delved into the filings, uh, as we did, you saw that they'd had, you know, more than $200 million of, of severance payments in the previous quarter, and then they said, look, this is likely going to recur again in this quarter, so clearly... They are moving around their workforce. They said, look, we're going to concentrate our resources on what gets us going in the future. Um, but that means that they're probably going to shed some jobs uh, you know, in other parts of the company. That's what we do here at Bloomberg Technology. Not just the earnings print, not just the call, but Ian King goes sleuthing through the filings. And that's where we find 
the juicy details, Blue Mersey and King. Thank you very much. The other name that we're talking about, top of the show, Etsy, falling as its outlook basically failed to reinsure investors on growth. Let's get more on Etsy's earnings and bring in Shweta Kajuria, Evercore ISA analyst. Shweta, you got an outperform rating on Etsy, which is interesting. Also, a 105 price target. What were the main takeaways for you from that earnings print? Uh, thanks for having me, Ed. A uh, few things. One, there were some positives, and then clearly there were some negatives. And as you mentioned, the stock's uh, trading off. Uh, uh, part of the reason why the shares may also be trading on, off, however, is that there was some run-up into the print with expectations, of modest uh, expectations correction in addition to just a lower-than-expected uh, guide so on, on fundamentals, too. In terms of what I took away from, um, from the earnings call, there are some green shoots. First thing is that buyers uh, came in at an all-time high, second uh, consecutive quarter of year-over-year -year growth. Second is that the habitual buyer, which account for about 45% of their GMS, actually uh, started showing signs of stabilization, and that's a key metric. And then third is GMS for active buyer, which is somewhat of a, a purchase frequency uh, proxy, also showed signs of stabilization. And that's also a great metric uh, in terms of looking at improvement. So what did not work? Well, Etsy is a highly discretionary platform, and they are continuing to see pressure, macroeconomic pressure on um, the consumer wallet. They did call out that households that make less than $100,000 in income are seeing a mix shift in spend from away from discretionary to non-discretionary spend. They also talked about some categories seeing some green shoots, such as home and living crafts and apparel, but there are a lot of other discretionary categories that are pressured. And they also are talking about uh, just generally consumer spend being pressured because of the end of student loan uh, forbearance, as well as the child tax credit that will be coming in. So all of that is pressuring the consumer spend, and they are uh, uh, highly skewed towards discretionary spend. I, I want to think about Etsy as a technology platform, Shweta. You know, it... it is a place where the consumer meets small retailers all over the country, all over the world of different sizes. But what is it that differentiates them from a technological perspective? Well, there are a couple things. So first is that it's the type of product that they offer on their platform. It is very difficult to create a marketplace with a sticky set of sellers, which they have and a uh, largely sticky set of buyers who are either coming to the platform at least once a year, if not more, on a regular basis. And that itself is lightning in a bottle. That's very difficult to replicate at scale. Now they have over 90 million um, active buyers. So that's really good scale in some of their core markets. That's number one. And second is the, is the uniqueness of the products that are offered. So oftentimes at these compared to an Amazon or an eBay, but they know what they stand for. It's not the typical commoditized product that you can compare prices over, you know, across different platforms, whether it's offline or online. It's really a unique custom item that you want, which is special, which means something to the customers across different categories. And they have created a place for themselves uh, in that sort of, uh, uh, you know, e-commerce, when we think about e-commerce as a category. And so that is unique about them. And then the other thing about the technology is they, when we think about where Etsy was and where it came, I mean, several years ago, they didn't have the management team that they have today. This is a truly a turnaround story. And a huge reason why it's a turnaround is because what they did to the product, the user experience is phenomenally better and the search experience is so much better. And they are constantly iterating on it to drive user experience and engagement on their platform. And so far, they've done a great job. Shweta, the uh, FIFA Women's World Cup is on right now, and that's got us thinking about Fubo TV reporting before Market Friday. What are you expecting from them? I find them such an interesting platform. They're teeny tiny, um, they, but they still stand out in the market. They do. We actually are on the sidelines with Fubo primarily because we think that they do have profitability issue. Now, this was an asset. This was a business that went public when the when uh, businesses were given credit for you know, just driving top line growth at the cost of bottom line. But that no longer holds true. And now Fubo is at a place where not only do they have competitors which are much bigger than them, but they also have to focus on reining in their top line growth as this, so that they can become profitable. They also have debts that they need to think about and they have, uh, uh, you know, limited liquidity. So they're trying to not have another capital raise and become self-sustaining. And in, in, while they do that, 
they also have to show top line growth. So that is the biggest challenge that Kubo has, and that's why we're on the sideline. Just specifically to this quarter, they typically guide conservatively, and it, this connected TV engagement has been go, uh, going up. Uh, we saw a pretty good beat uh, at Roku, for example, um, and it, overall the demand for live sports, especially because of the writers' strike, and, uh, viewers are shifting a little bit towards live sports as well as news uh, because of the lack of content uh, driven yes. from the uh, Hollywood writers' strike. So that should also benefit Fubo at the margin. So I, I expect a a beat and a, a bracket sort of a quarter. Uh, but fundamentally, this is a, a, an asset that we question in terms of the longevity of the business. Yeah, that consumer behavior question is exactly where I wanted to go. I subscribe to every platform under the sun. Yeah. I love all sports. But you can get what you get on Fubo elsewhere as part of a broader mm -hmm. package. I'm thinking like Peacock, Paramount Plus, for example. How do they survive? in that landscape. It's so crowded. And when you have a tough macro environment, consumers have to make a choice. That's absolutely true. The Fubo's value proposition is they have, at, at the margin, they have some exclusivity on content. So regional sports, for example, you can find only on Fubo. And then there's some soccer games that you can find only on Fubo. So at the margin, there is some exclusive content that you can get on Fubo. The second thing is also just the user engagement. It, it, Fubo was built post all this connected TV, everything came on. So their product is very new. It's not archaic and it's easy to use as well as easy to navigate. So that's another reason why uh, uh, viewers are choosing Upa, Fubo over maybe some of the other platforms. And then finally, the third thing is that they do have a, they have created a brand name around themselves where almost all viewers view them as a sports first uh, offering, and it's it's good branding on their part, but it's it's you know the marginally exclusive content, but still that brand name of their uh, sports first, and they uh, offer a lot of engaging uh, sort of user experiences when you're watching football as it relates to fantasy, etc. And that's another yes. draw for uh, viewers know, to use Fubo. It, we we got to keep talking about it, you know, in later shows because messy mania in the context of Apple TV is really put football or soccer in this country and the streaming issue front and center. Shweta Kajuri, Evercore ISI, we love having you on the show. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. Now, coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, Canadian online retailer Shopify making good on its attempts to refocus its core business. Our conversation with its president, Harley Finkelstein, that's next. All right, we talked about it. The big ones after the bell, Apple and Amazon tech giants gearing up to report earnings. The story for Amazon, AWS and cloud. Apple set to report its third sequential year-on-year -year decline in revenues. That's the worst streak, by the way, going back to 2016. Does the iPhone come to the rescue? It's always the question. This is Bloomberg Technology. Shopify made progress in its attempt to prioritize its core business after cost cutting and price changes. The Canadian e-commerce giant reported second quarter sales and profit that beat analyst expectations. President Harley Finkelstein said the results speak to Shopify's efforts to improve shipping and expand its global merchant base. Harley joins us now. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to you, Harley. Okay, so a beat in the quarter somewhat negative share reaction and Morgan Stanley actually raised its price target on the stock $54 to 59 but they point out that what was missing was a roadmap for investors to understand how you're going to grow in the future so let's start there how are you yeah. going to grow in the future well look I mean you started by talking about our announcement last quarter uh, when we when we reported on, on Q1 and we talked about that we are really you know creating a new shape architecting a new shape of shop to make sure we can go faster with greater talent density for focus on our main quest which is commerce software and and, and retail software and the, the results are you know the re results uh, exemplify that right revenue is up 31 uh, percent up to 1.7 billion GMB is up to 70 was up to 55 billion dollars that's up 17 percent I think the thing that people missed however is that 
we are also earning more parts of a merchant's businesses. We use a, a metric here called the product attach rate, which measures the usage of our products, all of our products by our merchants. And that was above 3% for the second time. All that, and we also had the third consecutive quarter of positive free cash flow, and we expect that actually free cash flow profitability for the third quarter of this year to be greater than the entire first half. So we're, we're really firing in all cylinders here. But in terms of our, our you know, the future and and what we're looking to do next, there's a couple things. First of all. We now know that most people that are considering starting a business do so with Shopify. People that have ideas in the shower in the morning, aspirational entrepreneurs, Shopify is the go-to for them. Now, we know all not all will succeed, but the ones that do come to Shopify and stay with Shopify long to the future. I mean, that's the Gymshark stories. That's the Allbirds story, the Fig story, these homegrown success stories. But we're also seeing very large brands come to Shopify as well, whether it's companies like Spanx or it's Mattel or it's Glossier or it's Staples. We're seeing the enterprise come to us too. So that's the first thing. The second thing thing is when you look horizontally up at our through our merchant solutions, whether it's Shopify payments or Shopify capital or Shopify audiences, which helps you buy ads more effectively or things like collective, you're seeing we, we are looking across every pain point that a merchant may have and making it easier. Yes. You and I were talking uh, offline earlier just before we started about the size of Shopify. I mean, Shopify now powers more than 10 percent of all U.S. e-commerce retail, which means that if we were a retailer, we'd be the second largest retailer in America, online retailer in America. And that means that we can now get incredible economies of scale and give them to the millions of stores that use Shopify. And uh, we are we're excited about the future. And we're yeah. So Harley, I, I understand the story. The primary growth engine, business formation, and those new businesses stay with you for a long time. So what happens in a recession when new businesses are not formed? Yeah, there's two things that happen uh, in a recession. First of all, existing businesses look to one, modernize uh, the technology the software they use, and they look to also find the best value, the best value in the software they use. That's Shopify. I mean, for $39 a month, you can build a multi-million dollar, in some cases, a multi-billion dollar company. So Shopify's value to cost ratio is so far on the side of value that even in times of, of recessionary pressure, we've seen more and more merchants migrate to Shopify. That's the first thing. The second thing is on the consumer side. One of the other things that we're seeing, and, and you know, the GMV this quarter demonstrates that we had we saw $55 billion of GMV flow through Shopify. Consumers in these recessionary times vote with their wallets to buy direct from the brands they really care about. And all those brands are on Shopify as well. So both on the merchant side and the consumer side, we, we think that we, we, we've been around for almost two decades now. We've seen that we do well in, in, in both you know boom cycles and, 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 and bear cycles, and, uh, and we'll continue doing that. Harley, can you quantify it, the exposure that, that Shopify has to new business versus, uh, I suppose, a way of putting it is established online merchants? That's the best part, uh, Ed. We can do both. So the idea that you can start, you know, you can you have an idea in the morning, you can sit down at, at your mom's kitchen table or at a coffee shop, and you can build a store on Shopify in a matter of a couple of hours for $39. We see that happening every single day. At the same time, we're seeing much larger brands migrate over to Shopify as well, whether it's the Allo Yogas or the Vioris or the Spanx or Supreme, uh, one of my favorite brands, coming on to us to leverage this enterprise scale software. So that's the great part of the business model. It isn't simply just one segment of the market. It's the entire e-commerce stack. And then when you think about the future of retail being retail everywhere, I mean, our point of sale product this particular quarter had an incredible uh, had an incredible quarter. We're now going in and, and ripping and replacing old, dilapidated, traditional point of sale systems with Shopify point of sale. And what you end up with is a, a fundamentally a retail operating system. And I think that's what modern retailers want. They want one single place where they have an entire view of their business, regardless of sales channels. I, I heard a previous guest talk about you know Etsy being a great sales channel. Well, from Shopify, you can push products to Etsy if you want. You can also push products to TikTok and Instagram and online and offline and everywhere. But it all feeds back into one centralized retail operating system. And that really is a Shopify product. There's a relationship between Shopify and Amazon, Amazon reporting after the bell, and it's focused on fulfillment. A lot of folks I've spoken to want to understand what progress is there, the relationship with Amazon and, and Shopify? To many, it's kind of been a slow mover. Yeah, look, uh, I, I said this on the call yesterday because uh, I got a question just like this. Uh, you know, we're, we're still progressing there, but there's oh, no news to report on that just yet. OK, understood. Uh, we started this segment talking about the cost cuts you've made, particularly in the context of profit, and then mm -hmm. the roadmap, a lack of roadmap for future growth. Do co cost, 
co excuse me, do cost cuts continue or are you going to start investment mode again to start growing this business? Yeah. And the important part to understand about Shopify that I think a lot of our investors, and, and I actually think you probably know this too, is that we have always been very thoughtful about spending and we've always spent in a very disciplined fashion. We were not raised on venture capital the way some of our peers were. So we always, from the very early days of Shopify, we always made sure we stretched every dollar. So spending will happen, but in a very disciplined fashion. And so what we think, what we're seeing is that while OPEX will remain stable, revenue will continue to grow. I mean, revenue again, up 31% year on year. Um, when we see opportunities, however, where we can actually have incredible returns right now, for example, on things like offline marketing and point of sale, where the cost of customer acquisition profiles look really in line with, with an optimal uh, you know, CAC to LTV ratio, we're going to take those and, and, and we'll spend there, but we will always do so in an, incredible, in an incredibly disciplined fashion. In terms of the team size that you mentioned, we want to make sure we we retain the best and the brightest uh, on, on Shopify. We really like the size of the company right now. We expect headcount to remain largely consistent, uh, and, and we're not looking to undo any of the headcount decisions from last quarter, but obviously we, we do want to make sure the best and the brightest come here and stay here, and, uh, and we'll continue doing so in a very disciplined, thoughtful way. All right, Shopify President Harley Finkelstein, when you're ready to talk about Amazon, do it back here on Bloomberg Technology. Thank you. Thank Coming you. up here on the show, a new high score for Nintendo with the release of some new summer games. You know exactly the title I'm talking about. Earnings recap coming up next. Watching shares of DoorDash reporting record numbers for delivery orders in the second quarter. Consumer commitment to takeout despite those rising prices. Shares up 4.8%. This is Bloomberg Technology. Time for Talking Tech. First up, Nintendo hit a new high for first quarter profit after the successful launch to its latest Legend of Zelda. The game propped up sales of the Switch console and the Super Mario Bros. movie tripled Nintendo's licensing income. The Kyoto-based company reported op profit of $1.3 billion, beating expectation. Plus, investors continue to pile into Korean stocks related to superconductors amid claims of breakthroughs in the tech. We'll talk about that one a bit later in the show amid some development. And Juul seeking to raise about a billion dollars, that according to Bloomberg sources. The e-cigarette company that almost went bankrupt last year is working with Jeffrey's Financial Group on the fundraising effort. While Juul's valuation in the round remains unclear, it's expected to be dramatically lower than the $38 billion it was worth in 2018. Now coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, traveling with AI what it means, the tail end of travel season and their earnings with Expedia CEO Peter Kern. From here in San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. We're looking at shares of Expedia, now down 17%. That puts it on track for its biggest drop since March of 2020. Some concerns about top line growth. Second quarter profit was above forecasts. We're entering the kind of key period or tail end of the summer travel season. Joining me now, Expedia CEO, Peter Kern. Peter, we, we, we do have to start with the reaction. The stock is down 17%. Is the concern yep. from the market justified about the growth trajectory of your company? No, absolutely not. I mean, we basically delivered what we told the market we were going to deliver. And in the quarter, you know, just past the quarter, we launched our new big rewards program. We've made huge technical advancements and we reaffirmed our yearly guidance. So uh, not sure what the market was looking for. Maybe they're looking for concerns about the consumer. But basically, we were on our plan. And really excited about the back half of the year. So we were, you know, other than the chart you have behind me, we're very excited about where we are. So, so Peter, what's the story? Um, it, it, you know, how do you see this travel season having played out? And, and what are your signs into the rest of the year about bookings and the health of the consumer? Because it is what the street wants to know about, as you note. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, when we look ahead, our pacings for the year are up versus last year and prior periods, all prior periods, basically. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, very good, uh, there's been very 
uh, high interest in international travel. What you've seen is the travelers moving around a bit, so you see pockets that might be retreating a little bit, but other pockets advancing. So Asia's very strong, Latin America's very strong, uh, the West, U.S., North America, and uh, Western Europe, you know, have slowed somewhat, but they've been stable. Uh, so basically, customers are moving around. Cities are very popular. International cities are very popular. International travel has definitely eclipsed domestic and the rebound. Again, it's sort of this COVID unroll that we've seen again and again. People go where the next thing opens up or where they haven't been able to go. So domestic was very big. Then international got big. Now Asia's coming up because Asia's opening up. So we see it in waves and you know as we look out the consumer is very strong in travel uh, demand remains high there's not much evidence of uh, really at all of ADRs you know pricing dropping yes you can find that domestic air in North America the prices have come down a little but in international air they're they're still very elevated in international hotel uh, hotel generally has been very stable in ADRs so there really isn't much evidence of a consumer lapse here in any way Peter you're joining us from London. In fact, you're sitting in the chair that I used to sit in when I was at QBS based out of that studio. It's a nice chair. Is there yeah. a, a sort of differentiation between the health in different markets of a London consumer, a European consumer, and what we're seeing here in the United States? Well, I, I think, you know, again, you're seeing, first of all, there's a lot of people from the United States in London right now. You know, Europe has been a popular destination for North American travelers this summer because last summer they weren't traveling as much internationally. So now every city in Europe is full of Americans. And likewise, European travelers are traveling to other international cities. So you're seeing a lot of that. But the health of the consumer is strong. You know, we, we still haven't really seen it, even at the lower ends. It doesn't mean there isn't you know, you can't find a pocket of a city or a destination that's slightly lower. For example, uh, mountain destinations, beach destinations are slightly less popular this year in favor of big international cities. But it doesn't mean the travelers are less willing to travel or spend. It just means they're moving their dollars around and that creates small pockets that might, you know, where you might see some reduced interest, but that's from super high elevated interest across most of these markets. So this is, you know, a slight taming in a few spots and strength in other spots that make up for it. You've been doing some investment in technology, technological streamlining behind mm -hmm. the scenes with a sort of loyalty and rewards program. How, yep. how do you see that driving your business in the near term, but also longer term as well? Yeah, it's a it's a huge investment for us. I mean, first of all, we've invested over the last few years in a huge technological transformation to bring all our stacks together, all our brands together on one technology so we could go faster, innovate faster for the consumer. And really our loyalty, our new loyalty rollout of one key is a great example of all of that coming together where now our big three brands will be under one loyalty program. So Expedia, Hotels.com and Verbo people can earn rewards which is basically like money spend it on any product they want across all of those brands uh, and it's you know it's it's the culmination of a bunch of work that's been going on for more than two years to really change our future and our idea is a simple one which is we want to build the best products that consumers are loyal to get them into our loyalty plans get them into our app where they can have the best experience, see the most discounts, the most rewards for their travel, and that that will create a sticky relationship with our consumers and they'll come back direct to us. And we've seen it again and again in every industry. We think there's huge opportunity for innovation and travel, and we think we're doing the most with technology, with AI and machine learning to personalize and all of those pieces to really create the next step forward. You know, we invented the category and we're trying to reinvent the category for the next you know, decade or two with new product, better consumer proposition and, and really a much stickier, uh, less just transactional kind of product that, that travel used to be. So bear with me on this one, but in Meta's earnings, we saw evidence that AI recommendations boosted their ad sales as an example. Mm. Give me some tangible examples of how artificial intelligence aids the consumer on your platform, but also just helps you guys make more money. Yeah, so we use it really everywhere we can, and that doesn't mean everywhere yet, but throughout the product from everything from optimizing the pictures you see, uh, you know, you might be traveling with a, a family or kids and we will show you pools or maybe you're traveling by yourself or a couple and we might show you bars or, or rooms or other things. Like we optimize that, we optimize how you search, we, optim we use machine learning to uh, better move the pieces around the page so you're seeing the things that are most relevant to you the e most easily. Or 
to simplify how you shop. So you might know that some rooms are called a queen size superior, or some rooms are called a king size something city view. You know, we've done all the work to compare all those things so that you can easily see them side by side and understand, uh, you know, using AI and ML, understand what the options really mean and what the differences are. So we're using it in, in all kinds of simple and elevated ways. We've also put ChatGPT into our iOS app. We just launched it in our Android app. So we're giving people that utility if they want to use it for discovery. And then we save products that they've looked at and they can go compare them later. So there's lots of places we use it, but some of them are quite simple and straightforward, you know, personalized search and other things. And some of them are the latest large language models and all of those opportunities that are still ahead of us. All right, Expedia CEO Peter Kern, thank you so much for your time. Another stock that we're watching, Aurora Innovation, just raised the better part of a billion dollars. The self-driving company working with transportation industry leaders like Toyota, FedEx, Volvo, to basically operationalize self-driving semi-trucks. But also we're thinking about consumer vehicles. The stock down seven-tenths of one percent have been up earlier in the session. The story in the court have gone shrinking losses, which is a good thing. Joining us now, or Aurora CEO Chris Hermsen. It's good to see you in person again. Yeah, it's wonderful. Been a while. Let, let's start with the money. You know, it's $820 million or so. How have you explained to investors how you're going to use it? Really? So I think first and foremost, it is kind of incredible to raise that money in this environment. Really a strong vote of confidence from the investor community. What it's about is delivering our product. So next year, we expect to have trucks on the road with nobody in them and begin commercializing automated trucking. You and I have spent some time together in Texas on the road in these semi-trucks, you know, with a safety driver, granted. Yep. Um, just explain the pathway to making money on a business like that. I mean, for yeah. those, that's the frustration, understanding the application of the tech in the real world. Well, we have the opportunity of having a product that's going to have an incredible impact for our customers. We can help their top line and really drive down their bottom line. So if you're a trucking company today, what you really think about is how much money can I make per truck? And you're limited based on the fact that people are limited to drive trucks 11 hours a day. With the Aurora driver, we expect to be able to drive twice as much as that. And so you can double the revenue per truck while making it easier to uh, have drivers by making it safer on the road, uh, improving your performance as a business. We have seen this industry consider its long-term. Waymo has reevaluated its trucking business yeah. and, and refocused on the, the passenger vehicle. How do you view that split? Do you want to do both or just focus on the core trucking business? So we've been building a driver to work for both from, from day one. Now we're going to focus on trucking first, but we have an incredible partnership with both Toyota and Uber for the long term. We see trucking as a really great way to build a business here because the, the opportunity is so clear and present. The market is about 10 times bigger than the ride hailing market and the unit economics are much stronger. So for a new technology, that's really what you're looking for, is a, a business where you can grow into it and be profitable very quickly. We had Dara Khosrowshahi on, on the show last week and this week. I lose sense of, tra of time. But the point is, it's a partnership between the two of you. I think Dara's on your board as well. So explain to the consumer watching the show the future of what Uber using Aurora's technology looks like. Yeah, so, so a number of years ago, we were fortunate to acquire Uber's self-driving car business, and that was the kind of the foundation on which our partnership has been built. Dara's business, as I understand it, is really about providing the network and providing that interface to customers. We're really about providing drivers. And so we'll begin with trucking, where we can help other businesses, including Uber Freight, uh, operate theirs. And then in the long term, we'll provide drivers to help provide it, make it easier, more equitable for people to get around. Chris, you've been a leader in the self-driving space for a long time. And I feel like, you know, I've been talking for a long time about we're close, we're yep. close, we're close. Where are we, to your mind right now, in real-world deployment of vehicles that do not have a driver in the front seat? I think it's an incredibly exciting time. The, the zeitgeist is kind of out of phase with reality. So about five years ago, it was, oh, this technology's here, everyone's gonna have it tomorrow. And that was clearly not true. Whereas today, you know, there's increasing doubt about whether this is going to happen. But in practice, it is happening, whether it's on the streets of San Francisco or L.A. or Phoenix or with us hauling loads today for customers delivering goods. The future of Aurora is a standalone business. I know you've raised the money. The capital is significant. 
but do you still have full confidence that the best way to go is a business model where you just make the tech and you, and you provide it rather than, say, sell yourself to a fleet operator or, you know, there are others that have taken that route? Yeah, I've, I've never been more confident about the prospects of our business or the path we've taken to get here. You know, over the last six, seven years, we've really made a number of strategic bets, whether it's on our LiDAR technology, on our simulation technology, and our partnership model. And that's all kind of playing out as we see the competitive landscape kind of winnow around us. Aurora CEO, Chris Emerson, it's good to catch up. It's been a while since I've been in that self-driving semi on the roads of Texas. Now, coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, we sit down for an exclusive conversation with Flexport founder Ryan Peterson, who's just joined Founders Fund as a partner. This is Bloomberg. Time for VC Spotlight. Ryan Peterson, the founder of logistics startup Flexport, has joined the venture capital firm Founders Fund as a partner. Ryan joins me now here on set in San Francisco. I mean, that's how we know you. We know you as Flexport. We saw the news that you've joined Founders Fund. Why? Uh, you know, well, Founders Fund's been probably my most, like, consistent backer of Flexport. I think they, they led our Series A, our B... Uh, participated in the C and the D and then led the E round. So, like, I mean, basically, they've been with me since day one, I'm, uh, and they've been incredibly supportive of the company. Uh, more importantly, I feel like Flexport has this incredible leadership team in place. Right, uh, Dave we've, Clark, right. Yeah, we hired Dave Clark and also a, a really strong group of people under him, both uh, people we've had for a long time and some, a lot of new folks, too. Felt like the company's doing really great in a really good place. There was less for me to do, and I, you know, I'm kind of like an all-or-nothing guy. And I don't like the nothing side of that. I'd like want to go so, all in. Do you completely walk away from Flexport? Oh, no, definitely tame? not. OK. Uh, in fact, I feel like I'm working more on Flexport since I joined Founders Fund than I was before. Because it's like, I don't know, there's something about the energy of working hard that leads to more working hard. OK. Um, have you always been interested in being an investor? I, I find that relationship interesting. You spend a lot of your life trying to raise money mm. as a founder. Are those transferable skills to go the other way? Uh, no, no, I don't know. Yeah, yes, I've always been interested in being an investor. I think I read uh, Benjamin Graham, the intelligent investor, when I was about 16 years old for the first time. So always been very interested, even was interested in stocks before that. So yes, uh, did I have aspirations to be a VC? No. Uh, in fact, even in t as recently as like a couple months ago, I wasn't thinking about that. But uh, Founders Fund reached out to me, courted me, and convinced me that I could still run Flexport, still be actively engaged in Flexport, let's say as the chairman, uh, and do this job. And they've got, I think I'm the fourth or fifth person at Founders Fund. It's like almost full time running their company and being an investor and taking on two jobs and working hard. And uh, I think being in the arena, running a company or being really active in the company like I'm doing can help you be a better investor. So you said, I think that you want to be a generalist, but there must be some criteria or some thematic strategy that you're looking at. Um, I'm a generalist in life. I try to learn a little bit about everything. That's my number one value is learning. And being a VC is an awesome platform for that because I get to see all range of ideas and stages and business types and business models, geographies, everything. Um, for me, that's what I love is like learning, meeting people, helping them. Um, as for like a specific theme, no, it's much more about the people. Like I want to find people who are really in it for the right reasons, like very passionate about what they're building, maybe have a chip on their shoulder, feel like they've been wronged in some way at some point in their life and want to prove to the world that they're they're the best. Um, not just people who are, you know, trying to make a quick buck or get higher status by starting a company or something like that. But open minded to size, stage, sector. Yeah. So Founders One has like we like to go in the earliest stage. In fact, we've started some great companies. Andural was incubated right. inside of Founders Fund. Um, um, we're we like to be early because, of course, you get better returns yes. if you're early, but uh, we have a very large growth fund, $3 billion growth fund to do later stage stuff too. So we got to be looking across all stages. Al alongside being the founder of Flexport, I've been reading about you. You've been an angel investor and you've been associated with many startups, a hundred or so. Yeah. What have you learned from that? Are there sort of specific red flags when you're speaking to a founder or things that really attract you about backing someone? Um, yeah, I mean, I get to meet a lot of amazing founders and have an amazing network now. I've met, uh, you know, probably 
a huge percentage of the of the great startup founders, in, at least in the San Francisco area, over the last uh, decade. I um, I think I have to unlearn as much as I learned from angel investing. You're sort of like, well, just take a bet, do 100 investments. It's a conviction or gut call. Yeah, and there's also you're riding other people's signal. There's some other VC who's leading this round. You're not really pricing yet. You're not making the decision. Is this a go or no go? You're sort of like, oh, these smart people are investing. I'll just throw in a check and go for it. Uh, being a VC is very different. You have to have conviction. You have to convince the founder you're the best partner. You're not just like sliding a check into a a crowded round like you are as an angel. So um, I think I have to unlearn as much as I, uh, I learned. You're, you fresh into this new journey with, with Founders, but what's your kind of working relationship been like with Peter Thiel? And, and has it changed at all from the time that you've led Flexport? You talked about Founders leading many of the rounds in the company. Uh, well, I think, you know, Peter is an icon. He founded PayPal, and we, the PayPal mafia famously went on to start tons of companies. Well, P Peter was the CEO of that company and the founder, so he's got probably the best network of anybody in the technology industry, best track record of investing, founders fund. Like, I mean, you can talk to the LPs, the best results in the last, certainly in the last cycle. Um, and, uh, and frankly, I think comes up with the best original ideas. I just love, like, every six months or so, he drops a new video that you can find on YouTube and just, like, not, I'm not saying all the ideas are right, but they're all interesting. Uh, and it's pretty amazing to get to work with him. He also wrote the best book on startups the last 20 years that I think everybody should read if you're building a company zero to one. Uh, we're coming up on the 10th anniversary of that. And that's an incredible book that everybody should read. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot to leverage there and ride off his coattails and learn from him. I'm, I wouldn't say our relationship has changed. I hopefully I get to uh, be a lot more intimate and spend time learning about, you know, like deep in the weeds, how, how, what happens behind the scenes that I'm excited for that. Yeah. I know that you, you, you've outlined some experience in being an angel investor, but literally in the last two or three weeks, how has your day-to-day -day been? Have you had a lot of inbound yeah. from founders, or have you been out there in the real world looking for things? Um, both, yeah, tons of inbound. Thank you, everybody. Keep reaching out. Uh, my DMs are open on Twitter. So uh, lots, of, lots of great inbound, lots of referrals from friends and network and other CEOs telling me about companies. I've probably already said no more times uh, in the last three weeks than in my whole career combined. And that's kind of the nature of VC is you have to say no to 99.9% .9 of the stuff you see. But um, so I have to figure out how to do that in a way that people still like me and want to talk to me and hang out with me and send me more stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and interestingly enough, I'm finding myself going back and working harder at Flexport now. There's something about, again, like working hard leads to more working hard. Uh, and so getting more involved in the sales process, Flexport needs to keep growing and, and being successful. A story of the year we're talking to everyone about is X. You're active on X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, the idea of an everything app. What is your take on an everything app? You're confusing me calling it X. I'm like, wait, what? Twitter? Um, I, I don't know enough what the vision is. I think Elon's had a pretty consistent track record. I, wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't bet against him. And I think Twitter is the most important um, technology platform out there in terms of social media and the ability for everybody to communicate. We take it for granted, but it's so awesome that you can like just message with anybody on planet Earth, anyone who's on there, which is a lot of the intellectual thought leaders on the planet. Ryan Peterson of Founders Fund Now. We've known you on Bloomberg Technology for so long as part of Flexport. Thank you for coming in and talking about this next journey with us. Come back when you make some investments. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. That'd be great. All right. Coming up here on Bloomberg Technology. Are you obsessed with superconductors? Well, you're not alone. I myself, and for who wrote this, guys? I myself am feeling the hype and craving this technology as it's being felt in trading floors all over the world. We're going to talk about that next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Ambient superconductors are sparking up an obsessive following. It's the technology behind transporting electricity with no resistance and at lower temperatures. And it has the potential to transform life as we know it. Experts in South Korea claim to have synthesized the world's first superconductor known as LK99. And since then, shares for superconductor related stocks have seen a massive jump. Now, AK99 is not peer reviewed, but what's happened is that labs around the world are now trying to replicate the results. Once more research becomes available, superconductors could reshape the energy industry, reducing waste, lowering bills, and helping to cope global warming. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Check out the podcast for the recap. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>